Here comes the sun, interpreting Revelation the surprising key. The most stupendous claim ever put forward by any person was that put forth by a young carpenter from a little village in the hills of Galilee some two thousand years ago. His family was poor and unknown, his foster father was the village carpenter, and this young man worked unnoticed by the world in that carpenter shop until he was thirty years of age. Then, when he reached his thirtieth birthday, he stepped out from the family circle, out of the carpenter shop, out of the quiet hills of Nazareth, and boldly proclaimed to the entire world that he was the Savior of mankind, the long-expected Messiah, the Son of God. Was Jesus of Nazareth truly the Son of God that the Word of God predicted would come? But very few people believed him then. Was Jesus truly the Messiah? How can we prove undoubtedly from the Word of God that Jesus of Nazareth was truly the Son of God? Now, one of the most important aspects of this study in the book of Revelation is that it is designed to present history in the light of Bible prophecy. As we look at history, we compare it with Bible prophecy, and then we can believe what the Bible is saying. Now, this is how the early Christians believed. They saw in Jesus the perfect fulfillment of all the messianic prophecies. And because of their faith in the accuracy of the Word of God, they believed that Jesus was the Messiah. It was strictly on the basis of fulfilled prophecy, on what was written in the Scriptures that the early Christians acknowledged and then accepted Jesus of Nazareth as the Son of God. Many had never seen him before, but when they read the prophecies they believed that he was the one that was to come. And we can do the same today. Now, God has preserved his holy book so that we too can know whether Jesus of Nazareth was truly the Son of God. The faith of the early Christian believers was not based on the evidence of their senses on what they felt but upon the certainty of God's Word, and upon the promises and prophecies recorded in the Holy Bible. Once they were convinced that the Word of God revealed the Messiah, the Christ, the Living Word, the Living Lord, then they went out to proclaim the Christ a prophecy. The early Christian Church accepted Jesus the Christ by faith. The Bible, and the Bible alone, was the foundation for the faith of these early Christians. Now, let's go to verse 9 of Revelation chapter 1, as we find in this section the surprising key for interpreting the book of Revelation. Let's look at Revelation 1 and verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, Christ is supplied here, friends. It's not in the original Greek text was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Again, Christ is supplied. The Apostle John, the last remaining disciple, was the one chosen to pen the book of Revelation. He calls himself our brother and companion in tribulation. Even though he was the last of that faithful band of twelve that walked with Jesus, yet he still refers to himself simply as John, your brother and companion in tribulation. He does not give himself any titles except brother and companion in tribulation. John had already distinguished himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, and he did not need to be addressed with some exalted human title. As the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 verse 25, referring to one of his trusted helpers in the faith, he says, Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion and labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he that ministered to my wants. Friends, the kingdom of God is established on different principles than are the kingdoms of this world. There is to be no rank among the servants of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice what Jesus says to us. and to the religious leaders of his day, as he denounced the Pharisees in Matthew 25, 23, verse 5 through 12. Here's what the Bible says there. But all their works they do, for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries, and enlarge the borders of their garments, and 
love the uppermost rooms at feast and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called a man rabbi rabbi but be not called rabbi jesus says for one is your master even christ and all of your brethren and call no man your father upon the earth for one is your father which is in heaven neither be ye called masters for one is your master even christ but he that is greatest among you shall be your servant and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted friends the uh, pharisees in jesus day did not bring their works into accordance with the written word they they exalted and exacted duties upon others that they themselves were not willing to do they did not practice their own teaching and they wanted to place the people under their ecclesiastical authority they wanted the people to look up look up to them to call them exalted titles like rabbi and father and master and reverend according to psalms 111 verse 9 but Jesus says, don't do this, because all of your brethren. And friends, any time we do this, it leads to ecclesiastical superiority. Now, we are to honor human agencies in whom we see the loveliness of Christ's character. But we're not to dishonor God and him who was sent of God by giving to men flattering titles like father and reverend. No human being ever heard the Lord Jesus called any man reverend or right reverend. Friends, our highest honor is our humility, and gr true greatness is measured by moral worth. Those who took exal exalted titles in Christ's day were rebuked by Christ as hypocrites. The only title the Apostle John gives himself in the book of Revelation is brother and companion in tribulation. Brother John, that you can call him. Brother John, the one whom Jesus loved. Now the Bible tells us here in Revelation 1.9 that John was on the island of Patmos because of his faith in Jesus. It was around the year 73 AD when John was banished to the island of Patmos to labor on the mines there. Persecution must have been widespread at this time because John says that not only was he there on the island of Patmos, but also he calls himself a companion in tribulation, indicating that there were other Christians also being persecuted for their faith. Not only was the leader of the church in trouble, but the church itself was going through great tribulation around the year 73 AD. Now, 2 Timothy 3.12 says this, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Have you ever asked yourself why persecution seems to slumber in our day and in our age? Well, I believe the only reason is that the church has conformed to the world's standard and therefore it awakens no opposition. The religion which is current in our day, friends, is not of pure and holy character that marked the Christian faith in the days of Christ and his apostles. It's only because of the spirit of compromise with sin, because the great truths of the Word of God are so indifferently regarded by the pastors and reverends and right reverends and fathers and all these so-called religious leaders, because there is so little vital godliness in the church that Christianity is apparently so popular with the world. Friends, let there be a revival of the faith and the power of the early church. And the spirit of persecution will be revived. And the fires of persecution will be rekindled. If we live the word of God, friends, there is coming persecution. Now the history of John affords a striking illustration of the way in which God can use aged workers. When John was exiled to the island of Patmos, there were many who thought him to be past service. An old and a broken old man, ready to fall at any time. But the Lord saw fit to use him still. Though banished from the scenes of his former labor, he did not cease to bear witness to the truth. Even in Patmos, he made friends and converts. He, his was a message of joy, proclaiming a risen Savior. 
who was on high, who was interceding for his people, until he should return to take them to himself. And it was after John had grown old in service of the Lord that he received more communication from heaven than he had received during all the former years of his life. You see, it's not always like it appears. Many would have thought the Apostle John was cursed to be on the island of Patmos. But what seems like a curse in our eyes may be a blessing. And with every trouble, there is hidden in it the seed of an equivalent benefit. As the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, he says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And so there was John on that rocky barren island. The situation seemed hopeless, but it was there on Patmos, among the angry rocks and the mighty waves, that John received the greatest of all visions given to any of the prophets. And it was on the Lord's day when he received these visions from God. The Bible says there, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Now, the expression in the Spirit means to be in vision. John was in vision on the Lord's day, the seventh day Saturday, Sabbath, when he heard behind him a great voice like a trumpet. Now, the expression in the Spirit helps us to see that, that John received more than one vision as he compiled the book of Revelation. This phrase is found again in three other locations. In Revelation 4 verse 2 the Bible says, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. We find the phrase again in Revelation 17 verse 3. The Bible says, So he carried me away in the Spirit, into the wilderness. That is John's third vision in the book of Revelation. Now the fourth vision is found in Revelation 21 verse 10. The Bible says in Revelation 21 10, And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem. Now, John is given four great visions in the book of Revelation. And it was on the Lord's day in which John received his first vision. The Lord's day mentioned is the Saturday Sabbath, friends, the day on which God rested after his great work of creation, the day which he blessed and sanctified because he had rested upon it. Genesis chapter 2 verses 2 and 3 says, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day, and sanctified him, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Friends, the Sabbath was given at the very beginning of human history. It was the only day that was blessed, sanctified, and set apart as a holy day of worship. From the very beginning of human history, imagine that, Saturday was the Lord's day, and it was faithfully kept by the Lord's people until just before the giving of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Notice what Exodus 16 verse 29 says, See for that the Lord hath given the Sabbath, well, surely he gave it their creation. Therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. Oh yes, the Lord had already given to his people the Sabbath at the very beginning of creation week. In grand and awful majesty, that law was known by Adam and Eve and all the patriarchs and was repeated on Mount Sinai. Repeated. Exodus 20 verse 11 gives us the words of the fourth commandment. And it says there we should remember for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. In Exodus 31 verse 15 the commandment is repeated. Notice what the Bible says there. Six days may work be done, but the seventh is a Sabbath of rest, holy 
to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Well, the Sabbath, friends, is holy to the Lord. It's not our day. It's the Lord's day. Holy to the Lord. And therefore, it constitutes the Lord's day. There is no other day set apart for a holy use in the Bible except the seventh day Saturday. And even the Gentiles were to observe the seventh day Saturday as a Sabbath. Look at the words of the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 56 and verse 6. The Bible says, Also the sons of the stranger, that's the Gentiles, that join themselves to the Lord to serve him, and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, every one that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and taketh hold of my covenant. Friends, if you keep the Sabbath, you've taken hold of the new covenant. Yes, all the world was to acknowledge the Lord as the Lord of the Sabbath, even the Gentiles. But the Jewish people hoarded the truths of the Word of God. And instead of becoming a light to the world, they hid their candle and were rejected as God's people. The seventh day, friends, has always been the Lord's day in Scripture. Matthew 12, verse 8 says, For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. That's Saturday. And Mark chapter 2, verse 28 adds, Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. And finally, the Bible says in Luke chapter 6, verse 5, And he saith unto them that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Friends, it was on the Sabbath that the Lord of glory appeared to the exiled Apostle John. The Sabbath was as sacredly observed by John on that rocky, barren island of Patmos as when he was preaching to the people in the towns and cities of Judea. He claimed as his own the precious promises that had been given regarding that day. I was in the Spirit, the Bible says, on the Lord's day, John writes, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And I turned to see the voices spake with me, and being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. That's Revelation chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. Now God honors those who honor Him by obedience to His precepts. John, the beloved disciple, was banished to the island of Patmos for his faithfulness. I, John, he writes, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God, and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He was there, keeping the Sabbath day, for the word of God, and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, he says. Now that John here means Sunday, there is... But one day called the Lord's Day, friends, and that is the seventh day of the week. The Sabbath instituted at creation. God created the world in six days, and on the seventh he rested. And he was refreshed. That's what the Sabbath does for us. It refreshes us. He blessed and sanctified this day, and set it apart to be observed as a memorial of creation, as the birthday of the world. And on the seventh day, John heard behind him a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am an Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Thus Christ honored John for his steadfast obedience to him, even there on the island of Patmos. Friends, if there is any question as to whether the Sabbath is Saturday, just ask anyone today when Jesus was crucified, died, and ascended into heaven. They'll always tell you that Jesus died on Good Friday, rested in the tomb on Saturday, and then on the first day of the week, Sunday, he arose and went into heaven. The Sabbath is the day between Friday and Sunday, according to the Scriptures. We have these three days recorded for us in, in Luke's account of the crucifixion. His account begins by describing the day of the crucifixion on Friday in Luke 23, beginning with verse 54 through 56. The Bible says, And that day was the preparation 
and the Sabbath drew on. And the women also which came with him from Galilee followed after and beheld the sepulchre and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. And then in Luke 24, verse 1, the day of the resurrection is described for us. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. Friends, the custom of observing the first day of the week instead of the seventh day, a divine appointment, has no authority save that of tradition, a popular custom, and the command of the Roman Catholic Church. The Church of Rome is has been the agent by which Satan has made this breach in the law of God and turned the entire professed Christian world away from the precepts of Jehovah. God said, remember, and the entire world has forgotten. But what a wonderful day the Sabbath is. It was the day that the Apostle John kept as a sacred appointment with his Lord Jesus, and it was on the Sabbath that John received his first vision of the book of Revelation. And he says that he heard behind him a great voice as of a trumpet. When he received his first vision, uh, the voice of the Lord here is compared to the sound of a trumpet. In the book of Exodus, chapter 19, verse 16, the scenes of Mount Sinai are played out, and the voice of God is heard as God himself speaks to his people, the Ten Commandments. The Bible says that God's voice was like a trumpet, Exodus 19.16 says, And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a, and a thick cloud upon the mountain, the voice of a trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that it was in the camp trembled. And this text, the terrors of Sinai, were to represent to the people the scenes of the judgment that's coming, friends, the judgment that comes at the second coming. And the sound of a trumpet called all of Israel to meet with their God. Uh, the trumpet has always been used to call the people of God to special occasions. It was the sound of a trumpet that opened uh, the temple services at the beginning of the day. When the year of Jubilee came around, it was brought in by the sound of the silver trumpet. And on the last day of this planet's history, the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God will summon from the whole earth the living and the righteous dead to the presence of their judge. 1 Corinthians 15.52 says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Notice that it says, shall, in this text. The resurrection trumpet has not yet sounded. And the dead have not gone to their heavenly home. That occurs at the last trumpet. Then then we shall be changed. And so the trumpet of the Lord called the Apostle John to his appointment with his Lord on that faithful day. And John received his first vision of the book of Revelation. Look now at verse 11 of Revelation chapter 1. Revelation 1 and verse 11 saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Taratira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Send the revelation that I give you to the seven churches, the Lord tells his disciples. Now, the names of the seven churches are symbolic of the Christian church in different periods of the Christian era. The number seven indicates completeness, and it's symbolic of the fact that the messages extend to the end of this world's history. We begin with Ephesus, the church of the Apostle John, and Laodicea as the church friends of these last days. Philadelphia and Laodicea. The messages of the seven churches extend to the end of time, while the symbols used reveal the condition of the church at different periods in the history of the world. Send the revelation, John says, to Ephesus, which means desirable, 
and to Smyrna, which means myrrh, and unto Pergamos, which stands for objectionable marriage, and unto Taratira, which means sweet savor of labor, and unto Sardis, which means that which remains, and unto Philadelphia, which stands for brotherly love. And lastly, send the message to Laodicea, which stands for a people judged. Now, the Apostle John was to send the information he received to these seven churches, churches which actually existed in John's day. Let's go to verse 12 and 13 now of Revelation chapter 1. And I turned to see the voices spake with me, and and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed of the garment to the foot, and girt about the paps, with a golden girdle. The instant John turned at the sound of a trumpet, he saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the middle of the candlesticks, one like a Son of Man. John saw the Lord Jesus standing among seven, not just one candlestick. Now, in the Old Testament scriptures, the candlestick was one hammered piece of gold, symbolizing that the Jewish nation was to be one people outwardly. God was working primarily with the Jewish people in those days. He considered them his people. Israel was one church, one people under God. Here in the New Testament, Jesus is pictured in the midst or in the middle of seven separate and individual candlesticks. This shows that each of the candlesticks represents the church in its fullness for that particular time. Each one of the candlesticks illustrates that God still has a people, but they shine only in their period of time, each individually and separately until the second coming of Jesus. Ephesus represents the Church of the Apostles and their followers, and the Church of Laodicea represents the Church of the end time. How thankful we can be that the Lord, it is the Lord who is seen in the midst of the seven candlesticks. Jesus is the one who is in charge of the seven churches. The picture of Jesus in the midst of the candlesticks reveals eternal vigilance. Christ is in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks walking from church to church, from congregation to congregation, from heart to heart. He that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. If the candlesticks were left to the care of human agents, how often the light would flicker and it would go out. But friends, God has not given His church into the hands of men. Christ, the one who gave His life for the world, that all who believe in Him may not perish but have everlasting life. He's the true watchman of the house. He's the warder. He's the faithful and the true of the temple courts of the Lord. Jesus takes care of His church. We have reason to thank God that we are not dependent on the presence of earthly priests or ministers. We're kept by the power of God. We're kept by the presence and grace of Christ. That's the secret of all life and light. And the vision of the seven churches leads us into the confines of the heavenly sanctuary. It can be seen here that Jesus is clothed with the priestly robe and is ministering in the first apartment of the heavenly sanctuary, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Now to be girt about the paps is to be bound around the chest area. And the golden girdle that Jesus wears here is a golden sash, according to Exodus 28, verse 4. In the book of Revelation, Jesus' clothing shows that he's now gone to minister for us in the heavenly sanctuary in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. It's at this point that we need to go to the book of Daniel so that we might better understand more fully the position that our Lord Jesus holds in the heavenly sanctuary. The prophecy in Daniel 8.14 is of vital importance in finding the surprising key for understanding the book of Revelation. Daniel 8 and verse 14 says, And he saith unto me unto two thousand three hundred days, Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. When would this prophecy apply? 
Notice Daniel 8 and verse 17. So he came near where I stood, and when he came I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. In other words, this prophecy of the 2,300 days would extend until the time of the end. But did, did Daniel understand the vision by the time we come to the end of chapter 8? Well, no, he didn't. Look at Daniel chapter 8 and verse 27. And I, Daniel, fainted, and was six certain days. Afterward I rose up and did the king's business. And I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. In chapter 9 of the book of Daniel, an angel comes to give Daniel more understanding with respect to the prophecy. In Daniel 9, we have the longest time prophecy in the entire Bible, which reveals to us the amazing key for understanding the book of Revelation. Daniel 9, 24 says this, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for inequity and to bring an everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall uh, come shall destroy the city, and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he'll cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now this amazing prophecy located in the book of Daniel unfolds for us a thrilling story. With uncanny accuracy, this prophecy predicts the exact date of the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. It predicts the time of his death on the cross of Calvary. And finally, this remarkable prophecy predicts the ultimate rejection of the gospel by the Jewish nation and the date when the time of the Gentiles began. Imagine if the people in Christ's day had only studied the scriptures, especially the book of Daniel. They would have known uh, the exact date when the Son of God was going to visit mankind. And they could have prepared for him a royal welcome. But we all know the story of the baby Jesus and how he was born in a lowly manger. Throughout his life he was constantly rejected, despised, and persecuted. All because the people failed to understand the prophecies concerning him. Jesus, when he was here on this earth, recognized Daniel as a prophet. And he urged his hearers to pay very close attention to the prophecies that were given to him. Listen to Jesus' own words here in Matthew 24 and verse 15. The Lord says, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, Whoso readeth, let him understand. Now it's clear that Jesus wanted us to understand something in the book of Daniel, and the vision of Daniel 8.14 was one of the greatest, was and is one of the greatest visions ever given to any of the prophets. Here's one of the greatest prophecies in the Bible that takes us right into events that are happening today, and very few people know anything about this prophecy. I want you to understand that this prophecy be begins with Daniel 9.24 and it makes eight separate statements about the Messiah. Now the very first thing is listed here in verse 24 about the middle of the verse. One, he was to make reconciliation for inequity. Well, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ in the year 31 AD on the cross of Calvary perfectly fulfills this portion of the prophecy. By his death on the cross, Jesus brought heaven and earth into oneness, into atonement. Daniel 9.24 says that he would finish a transgression and make an end of sins, and make reconciliation for inequity. The prophecy also says that too he was to bring an everlasting righteousness. Again by his death on the cross, the Lord brought us the way, the truth, and the life of righteousness. We know what is right only by copying the great example that's been given to us in the life and death 
of Jesus of Nazareth. The Messiah was to bring everlasting righteousness. Righteousness can be defined, friends, only by God's great moral standard, the Ten Commandments. There is no other rule by which to measure character. Now, Jesus came to magnify the law and to make it honorable, Isaiah 42 and verse 21. Jesus did not come to do away with the law. That's why the Sabbath day is still effective today. That's why it's part of the law. It doesn't change. We should worship Jesus on the Sabbath. Now, by his death on the cross, the Lord Jesus forever established his holy law, the Ten Commandments. God's law does not change. And for that reason, Christ our Lord had to die in Calvary's tree. Jesus kept the Father's commandments and brought in everlasting righteousness. John 15 verse 10. Point number three says that the Most Holy was to be anointed for Christ. When Jesus died and arose, he went to the heavenly sanctuary to conduct a work of ministry in behalf of the entire human race. Hebrews chapter 8 verses 1 and 2 says that we have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle. Friends, the true tabernacle is in heaven. The true tabernacle is not on this earth. It's in heaven, which the Lord pitched and not man. Now, the most holy sanctuary was to be the place where Jesus would ascend after he finished his work here on this earth. The section of the prophecy said that the Messiah would come to anoint the Most Holy. And Jesus fulfilled one phase of his priesthood by dying on the cross for the human race. He's now fulfilling another phase of his ministry by pleading before the Father the case of, of the all repenting, believing sinners, presenting to God the offerings of his people. In verse 25 it says that he was to come at a certain time in history. The prophecy read in the middle of Daniel 8 and verse 25, Unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Now, if we continue the study of this great prophecy, we'll see that the Lord began his ministry in the year 27 AD, perfectly fulfilling this part of the prophecy. The Ma Messiah was to come at a certain time in history. Number five, he was to be cut off or killed. Now, we'll see that the exact year for the crucifixion is given to us in this greatest of all prophecies. The Bible says after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. To be cut off means to be killed. And this is exactly what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ. The exact time of the Lord's killing was specified in the Bible. Yes, he came to set up a kingdom, but it was not a literal kingdom. It would be a spiritual kingdom in the heart. 6. He was to be rejected when he was killed. In verse 26 of Daniel 9, the Bible says, But not for himself. Uh, this verse is better translated, And shall have nothing, or no one shall be for him. Friends, when Jesus was on Calvary's cross, he had no one to stand in for him. No one was in his favor. He died there all alone for you and for me. No one was for him as he died that cruel death on Calvary's tree. 7. He was to make a strong covenant with many for one week. As we study, we'll see that for seven years the Lord made the new covenant with the house of Israel. For three and a half years the Lord himself would strengthen the covenant. But for the remaining three and a half years his disciples would accomplish the work. Jesus began his ministry at the beginning of the prophetic week of seven years, and he did not die until the midst of the week or the middle of the prophetic week. He found that the new covenant in his own blood when he would die, thus fulfilling the prophecy. And lastly, he was to have an impact upon the sacrificial system. In verse 27 of Daniel 9, the Bible says that he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. In the middle of the 70th week, or the last week of the prophecy, at the time when Jesus died, the animal sacrifices and the cereal offering ceased, friends. That's why we don't sacrifice animals today. These things were to come to an end with the coming of the Messiah. Now the prophecy in Daniel 8.14 uh, reads, Under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now here's one of the, the greatest prophecies in the Bible that takes us right into events that are happening today. 
In Bible prophecy, a day stands for a year. And so a week of seven literal days would represent seven prophetic years. This Bible rule is found in Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6, and in Numbers 14.34. In Ezekiel 4.6, the Bible says, I have appointed thee each day for a year. And in Numbers 14.34, the Bible says, After the number of days in which you search the land, even forty days, each day for a year, even forty years. And so when Bible students accept this day for a year principle, prophecy immediately opens up to our understanding. Bible texts which you and I have never understood before are made simple. So in Daniel's prophecy we're dealing with a time span of 2,000, 2,300 years. But that's not the only time span that the angel gives to Daniel. The entire vision covers 2,300 prophetic years. But the angel also gives Daniel shorter time spans within the 2,300 prophetic years so that he'll better understand the prophecy. He begins by saying there in Daniel 9 and verse 24, Seventy weeks are determined upon or cut off for thy people and upon thy holy city. Now how much time is given for the people of Daniel, the Jewish people, as probationary time? Let's figure it out. Seventy weeks times seven days equals 490 days or 490 years. That 490 year period is given especially for the Jewish people and for the city of Jerusalem to get right with God. The Jewish people are being placed on probation, friends, here for a period of 490 years. These 70 weeks or 490 years will be cut off from the entire 2,300 year prophecy. Here's how we can diagram it. The entire prophecy stretches for 2,300 years. But the first 490 years of this prophecy are given especially for the Jewish people and for their city Jerusalem. It's during the 490 years that the Jewish nation would have a chance to show whether they wanted to remain God's faithful chosen people. They'd be on probation and be given 490 years to live up to their special privileges as God's people. But here comes a crucial question. When does the 2,300 year prophecy begin? We know that the 2,300 years and the 490 years both have the same starting point. But where is that starting point? In Daniel 9.25 we find the master key to the entire prophecy. Here the angel gives us the beginning day for the entire prophecy. The Bible reads there in Daniel 9.25 Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. And this prophecy begins from the commandment or the decree to restore and build the city of Jerusalem, not the temple. Notice it doesn't say to rebuild the temple, but the city of Jerusalem. You see, for 70 years the city of Jerusalem was in ruins while the Israelites were in captivity. But Cyrus, the Persian king, issued a decree that the Jewish people could go back to Israel to rebuild their city. Now it took the decrees of three Persian kings to finish the job. History tells us, and the Bible records in Ezra 7-7, that Artaxerxes I, king of Persia, was the last to give the decree which finally finished the construction of the city of Jerusalem. That was the year 457 B.C. And amazingly enough, this was the date for the beginning of the prophecy, the year 457 B.C. Now let's chart the dates. Let's begin with the 490 year period. Beginning with the year 457 B.C. and counting downward, 490 years brings us to the date 33 A.D. The prophecy said it would be 33 AD. It's important to remember that in Bible prophecy we must add one year, however, as we cross from the BC to the AD method of reckoning. The reason for that is that there was no year zero as we count down the years. So we must add one year, and this brings us to the year 34 AD. What happened in the year 34 AD? Now the prophecy said that at the end of the 490 years, or in the year 34 AD, 
the Jewish nation would be judged whether it, would, it had remained faithful to God. And by and large, the New Testament tells us that the Jewish nation rejected our Lord Jesus Christ and his teachings, and they placed him on the cross of Calvary. The Jewish people also rejected the preaching and the ministry of the apostles. In fact, it was in the year 34 AD that Stephen, one of the early Christians, was killed by a Jewish mob. He became the first Christian martyr. The persecution intensified so much after that that the Bible says the disciples were scattered abroad and went everywhere preaching the gospel because of the general persecution. And they preached not just to the Jews, but to anyone who would listen, but especially the Gentiles. It was in 34 AD when the time of the Gentiles began, friends. From that date onward, the Jewish people would no longer be considered God's favored people because they had rejected their Messiah and their King. The angel had said to Daniel in Daniel 9.25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. Now, what a remarkable prophecy this is. Daniel's heart must have jumped when he came to this part of the prophecy. Here was revealed the exact year that Jesus was to make his appearance to our earth. If the Jewish people had only studied the Word of God, they could have known the exact date of Jesus' first coming. One score in the Bible is 20. Three score is 60. So three score in two weeks is equal to 62 weeks. 62 weeks of 7 days per week gives us 434 days or years. We take the 434 years and add them to the first, first part of the prophecy, the 7 weeks. And so 7 weeks or 49 days and 62 weeks or 434 days gives us 483 days or 483 years to the Messiah. What a tremendous prophecy this is. The date for the coming of the Messiah, friends, the first time, is revealed in Scripture. So beginning in the year 457 B.C. and subtracting 483 years brings us to the year A.D. 27. Daniel's prophecy tells us that in the year 27 A.D. the Messiah the Prince was to make his appearance. Did he? Did Jesus of Nazareth make his official entry into this world in the year 27 AD? Now the word Messiah means the Anointed One. And Galatians 4.4 4 declares that when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his Son. And yes, it was in the year 27 AD that Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit for his work here on this earth. That's when he was baptized there in the River Jordan and received the Holy Ghost to do his great work of saving mankind. Acts chapter 10 verse 38 tells us, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. And I want you to notice that how Jesus began his ministry. Mark chapter 1 verse 15 says, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. These are the words of Jesus as he began his ministry. Yes, when God's prophetic clock struck, Jesus was right there in the river Jordan, being baptized and declaring that the time of the prophecy was at hand. Just imagine, the time, the exact time when Jesus would begin his work here on this earth was foretold almost 500 years in advance. What a sure foundation we have in believing that Jesus is the Savior of mankind. The one who walked the foam-capped waves and the one who fed the hungry was the one who came on time. He obeyed his father's prophetic clock perfectly. He was a man of time. When the prophetic clock struck, Jesus was there announcing the time is fulfilled. But this prophecy in Daniel went further. It not only told us the date of Christ's baptism, but 
It also foretold the date when mad human beings would seek to kill the Son of God on a cruel wooden cross. That's how accurate the prophecy is. Daniel's prophecy tells us that after 27 AD, the Messiah would be put to death. The prophecy read that the Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. Jesus, our Lord, would come to this world to die for the sins of all mankind as a perfect sacrifice. Daniel's prophecy in Daniel uh, chapter 9 verse 27 said, And he, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he'll cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. The prophecy said that halfway between 27 AD and 34 AD, in the middle of the week or seven years, the Messiah would be killed. Half of seven is three and a half. Jesus our Lord would die three and a half years after 27 AD for the entire human race. This means that Christ's own death on the cross would put an end to all animal sacrifices. The oblations would cease. The sacrifices would stop. Jesus would be the ultimate sacrifice, friends. That's why we don't sacrifice animals today. Because in 31 AD, the Jewish system of animal sacrifices was put to an end by the death of the real Lamb of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. After the year 31 AD, God would no longer accept animal sacrifices. And He doesn't accept animal sacrifices today. That would be to negate the great sacrifice of Christ on the cross. That's why the curtain in the Jewish temple was torn in two at the death of Christ. It was torn from top to bottom, not from the bottom to the top as a human hand would do it, but from the top by God Himself. Because the Jewish temple was no longer sacred, it was no longer needed. The ultimate sacrifice had been made on the cross of Calvary, by Jesus of Nazareth. Matthew 27:51 says, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. The three, three and a half years of Christ's ministry to the Jewish nation had come to an end. For three and a half years, Jesus had preached the good news to the, the Israelites. Then he was crucified. The remaining three and a half years of the last seven years of his probationary time was to be the responsibility of the disciples. But as you all know, the Jewish nation still did not accept Jesus as the Messiah, and in the year 34 AD the gospel went to the Gentile nations. Jesus had done all that he could have done for his chosen people. This is why he said in Matthew 15 and verse 24, I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The Lord is telling us here that he had dedicated himself fully to the saving of the Jewish nation while he was here on earth, because he knew that his people were on probation. The probationary time of the 490 years of Daniel's prophecy. But still the Jewish people rejected his offer of eternal life and would not accept him as their Lord and as their Savior. Even after the Lord had done everything possible, they still rejected His mercy, and they rejected His love. Hosea the prophet pinned the thoughts of God toward His people in Hosea 11 and verse 4. These are the words of Christ. I led them with cords of compassion, with the band of love, and I bent down to them and fed them. But still, they would not allow themselves, friends, to be saved. And the Jewish people in general rejected their Messiah. While here on earth they wanted to stone him, because he being a man claimed to be God by forgiving the sins of the oppressed and the needy. And then they placed him on trial, where they mocked him and they spat upon him, and they laughed at his claim to be the Son of God. They placed a crown of thorns around his head, and and clothed him with a purple robe, and the soldiers then began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And as they did, they spat on him, and bowing to their knees, they mocked him in worship. They questioned him as if he were a common criminal. They tried to measure his character by their own. 
and they attempted to represent him as filthy and as degenerate as themselves. Yet the King of Heaven, the Prince of Peace, allowed himself to be judged by wicked men, by mockers, by adulterers, by murderers. And they all compromised justice and their own conscience in order to go along with the rest of the crowd. Crucify him! Crucify him! That was a shout of the crowd. And then Jesus was taken, faint with weariness, his body covered with bleeding wounds. He was scourged in the sight of the crowd for something he didn't do or deserve. And the Roman whip ripped out pieces of flesh with each blow, and his body was covered with blood. And then, as if to say that they were innocent, they washed their hands of the blood of the Son of God. And instead of letting him go, they declared that he deserved to die. And so with his face disfigured, with bruises and swellings and numerous puncture wounds in the scalp, they placed a heavy cross on his weak shoulders. Pilate and the mob judged that Jesus was worthy of crucifixion, the cruelest death known to mankind. And the cross that was being prepared for Barabbas was now laid upon Jesus' bruised and broken and innocent body. The Bible says that he fell because of the weight of the cross was so heavy that he, he couldn't bear it any more. Jesus was so weak by the savage treatment that he was unable to carry his own cross to the place of execution. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him by nailing him to a wooden cross through both hands and feet. But Jesus did not call down curses on the soldiers who were handling him so roughly. No vengeance was invoked on the priests and the rulers who were gloating over the accomplishment of their purpose. In fact, Jesus only pitied them in their ignorance and in their guilt. They didn't realize that he was dying for them. He only breathed a, a plea for their forgiveness. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And so as the Lord Jesus died so that we could become our so that he could become our great high priest there in the heavenly sanctuary. That is where Christ is ministering for us today, friends. The prophecy in Daniel 8:14 along with Daniel 9:24 through 27 forever establishes the fact that Jesus of Nazareth is truly the Messiah. It was at Calvary that the Lord earned the right to be our great high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. This is why he's seen by John in Revelation 1.12 in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. In the sanctuary we find the key to the understanding of the book of Revelation. John's vision of the Son of Man is set in the context of the first apartment of the heavenly sanctuary. The earthly sanctuary had long before John's vision been destroyed in the year 8070. The earthly sanctuary was no longer uh, needed and it no longer existed. So we know the setting for this portion of Revelation is in the first apartment of the heavenly sanctuary. And this is a surprising key for interpreting the book of Revelation. It deals with the sanctuary. When Jesus died on Calvary's cross, he became the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. That's John 1, 29. And just like the little lamb was taken and killed on the altar of burnt offerings, so was Jesus killed on Calvary's tree for the sins of the whole world. When our Lord rose and ascended into heaven, he became our great high priest, entering into the first apartment, or the holy place, of the heavenly sanctuary. The prophecy in Daniel predicted the exact date for the baptism of our Lord in the year 27 AD. It predicted the exact date for his death on the, cross of, on the cruel cross of Calvary in the year 31 AD. And this remarkable prophecy predicted the exact date, the year 34 AD, as the time that the gospel of the good news of Jesus would go to the Gentile people. In a particular sense, this prophecy was a 490 year period of probation for the Jewish nation. 
490 years were given to them to see if they would be faithful in preparing the world for the coming of the Messiah. And as we all know, the Jewish nation completely failed in their mission. And they even placed God's only begotten Son on the cross of Calvary and put Him to death. But this prophecy did not just deal with the 70 weeks or the 490 years of Jewish probation. The entire prophecy was for 2,300 years, not just 490. And so if we subtract 490 from the 2,300, we come up with an additional 1,810 years. Add that 1810 years to 34 AD, and we come up to the year 1844. Now what would happen in the year 1844? Friends, in 1844 the Lord began His work of judgment in behalf of the entire human race. In 1844, on October 22, 1844, the Lord entered the second apartment of the heavenly sanctuary. And He's been in that apartment conducting a work of judgment in behalf of the, the entire human race. When Jesus finishes that work there in that second apartment, He's coming back. This is an amazing prophecy. And friends, here's the surprising key in understanding the book of Revelation. It deals with the sanctuary. When Jesus died on, on Calvary's cross, He became the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. John 1.29 And just like the little lamb was taken and killed on the altar of burnt offerings, so was Jesus killed on Calvary's tree for the sins of the entire world. Now when Jesus arose and ascended into heaven, He became our great high priest. He entered the first apartment, or the holy place, of the heavenly sanctuary. The Apostle Paul verifies this for us in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12, where he says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by His own blood He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Paul says that when Jesus became our great high priest, he entered, in, he entered in once into the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. This is the first apartment of the heavenly sanctuary. Here's a surprising key, friends, for interpreting the book of Revelation. Anytime we see Jesus ministering in the holy place or the first apartment of the sanctuary, we're dealing with a time frame from A.D. 31 A.D., that's when Jesus was crucified, to the year 1844, when the Lord entered the second apartment. That's how long the Lord ministered in that first apartment. Anytime we find any piece of furniture that belongs in the first apartment mentioned in the book of Revelation, then we're dealing with that particular time frame. But if we find the Lord in the midst of the second apartment, or any of the furniture, then we're dealing with the time frame of 1844 to our day, even to our time. The location of Jesus in the apartment makes all the difference in the interpretation of the book of Revelation. Let me give you an example. If you turn to Revelation 1.12, the Bible says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now, where is the candlestick located in the heavenly sanctuary? Well, why? It's in the first apartment. So this should tell us that the action of the seven churches which follows occurs from the year 31 AD to the year 1844. That's simple enough. Let me give you another example. Revelation 11 verse 19 says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. In this example we see the ark of his testament, or the ark of the covenant, which is located in the second apartment. This indicates to us that here we're talking about the year 1844, even to our day. The location of the Lord with respect to the furniture is very important in the interpretation of the book of Revelation because it gives us the time frame, my friends, for the prophecy. Now, we've learned that according to the prophecy of the 2,300 years, in the year 34 AD, probation closed 
for the Jews as God's chosen people. It didn't close for the individual Jew. They can be saved. But it closed only for the Jewish people as a nation. The final three and a half years of the Apostles' ministry was now ended with no apparent change in the behavior of the Jewish people. Three and a half years after the cross in the year 34 AD, probation closed for God's once favored people. I want you to notice what the Apostles said, uh, which indicated that probation had closed for the Jews as God's chosen people in the year 34 AD. Look at Acts 13 verse 46. The Bible says, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. And he's talking to the Jewish people. But seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Literal Israel, friends, the nation of Israel had rejected God by finally killing Jesus and his followers. And now God takes away from them as a nation the privileges and responsibilities of communicating his love to the world. And to whom was this privilege given after it was taken away from the Jewish nation? Well, the Bible says that this privilege went to the Gentiles, to the Christian church, to the ones who would believe in the Son of God. In Matthew 21, verse 43, Jesus warned plainly that he was taking the kingdom from the Jews and giving it to another nation. Notice to what nation he referred to. Matthew 21, verse 43 says this, Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, that's from the Jewish nation, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Friends, the chosen nation referred to here is spiritual Israel. That's you and me. The nation that would bring forth the fruits thereof. And every servant of Jesus from every race, from every country worldwide, can be a part of God's holy nation. In 1 Peter 2.9, the Apostle Peter says this, Of each one of us who belong to the Gentile nations. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should Show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Friends, you don't need to wait around for the Jews, the Israelite people as a nation, to find the Lord. They will in due, in due time. But we today are God's special favored people. The Jewish people failed in their mission. And they crucified our dear Savior. That's an important fact to know in interpreting any of the prophecies of the book of Revelation. Literal Israel, friends, failed to accomplish its mission for the Lord. And now the Lord has given that mission to the Gentile nations, to spiritual Israel, to you and me. Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, He's not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he's a Jew, which is what? Which is inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the latter. Whose praise is not of men, but of God. So it's clear from the scriptures that whenever the Bible mentions the name Israel, especially in the New Testament, we're talking about spiritual Israel and not the literal nation of Israel. Friends, the promises of the Bible are intended for those who have accepted Jesus as Savior and as Lord. They're intended for spiritual Israel, for you and for me. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You see, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he transferred his kingdom to spiritual Israel, and instead of using the temple in Jerusalem as his dwelling place, he went into the heavenly temple where he now ministers for us as priest in our behalf. And what's the role of a priest? Well, one of the most important functions of a priest is that he forgives sins. First John 1 John 1.9 says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins 
and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you see what the Lord Jesus did after his, after his chosen people rejected his ministry and his word? He transferred his kingdom to another people, to the Gentiles. And he transferred his temple from the earthly Jerusalem to the heavenly Jerusalem. Today we have the privilege, friends, of confessing our sins directly before Jesus Christ himself as he ministers and hears our confessions in heaven. Friends, Jesus is the only priest we'll ever need because he's the one who died off of Calvary for our sins, not any man. The power to forgive sins belongs only to God. And Jesus is God's only mediator between heaven and earth. No one can ever take his place. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, the Bible makes this fact very clear. The Bible says, Therefore there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Friends, friends the coming of Christ to this earth his suffering and dying a cruel death on the cross of Calvary forever abolished the human priesthood. Paul says in Hebrews 1, 8, 1 and 2, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Christ and he alone is now man's only mediator between God and men. Verse 6 of 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2 tells us why. It says there that it was Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Friends, Jesus' death on Calvary forever abolish all priestly order, orders. We don't need any priest. And so what does God expect us to believe if we're to understand the book of Revelation in our day? Well, he expects you and me to believe that we are the chosen children of God. And he expects us to believe that he's now gone to the heavenly sanctuary, not to the ruined temple in the city of Jerusalem. Christ's position in the sanctuary, which room he's ministering in, is the surprising key that helps us to understand the book of Revelation. Friends, the sanctuary truth illustrates that it was Jesus who took our place and died for our sins. He was the Lamb of God who was slaughtered for our sins. And as we believe in his shed blood, we can be saved in his kingdom. Do you know that the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark which housed the Ten Commandments, has been found? Ron Wyatt famed archaeologist has unearthed the most significant find, friends, in all of human history. The Ark of the Covenant has been rediscovered. It's there in the city of Jerusalem, hidden until the Lord in due time shall make it known. But the interesting thing is that it's been discovered outside the city of old Jerusalem in the area known as the Calvary Escarpment. The place is also known as the place of the skull, reflecting a pattern in the rock. Now here's what's important about this discovery. This find is the most significant archaeological find in all human history, friends. A number of dictators, including Adolf Hitler and Mussolini, felt that possessing the Ark would give them power over their enemies, and they aggressively sought to find it. Now, the ark was found in a cave below where our Lord was crucified. And the interesting thing is that there is a crack that connects where Jesus was crucified and where the ark was found. It's likely that the earthquake that took place at Jesus' death opened up the crack which ran from the base of the cross hole through the rock split open the casement lid of the ark and cracked the casement to its base. When the Roman soldiers pierced Jesus' side, his blood flowed down through the crack and the opened casement lid anointing, anointing friends, the, the atonement cover, the mercy seat, and the ark of the covenant. This is truly amazing. 
for this fulfilled in part the Day of Atonement, a Yom Kippur service, where the blood of the Lord's goat was to be sprinkled on the mercy seat. See Leviticus 16, verse 7, verse 15, and verse 16. Atoning for the uncleanliness and rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins had been. Friends, the blood, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ has been found there in the crack and in the cave where the ark is located. What a tremendous find this is. And and what foundation we have for believing that Jesus of Nazareth truly is the Son of God. Oh friends, it, it was Jesus who earned the right to be our only priest. He was the one that was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. He was the one condemned for our sins in which he had no share that we might be justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. Hebrews 7.25 says this, it says, He's able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Friends, Jesus is able to save us by his blood that he shed in our behalf. Don't you want to share in that salvation? The Bible says he's able to save us if we come to him. He's able to save us to the uttermost that come unto God by him, and we're saved by his blood. And because of that blood being shed, Isaiah the prophet says in Isaiah 53, verse 5, He was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our inequities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we're healed. Let's go to verse 14. Uh, through 16 of Revelation chapter 1, where Jesus is again described in a beautiful sevenfold way. Revelation 1, 14 through 16 says, His head and his hairs were like li white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet were like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as a sun shining in his strength. Here in verses 14 through 16 of Revelation chapter 1, we have the, the second sevenfold description of our Lord Jesus Christ. The first sevenfold description was given to us in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 1. Here, however, we have his head, his eyes, his feet, his voice, his right hand, his mouth, and his countenance described. What a beautiful sevenfold description the prophet presents to us of our Lord Jesus Christ. Truly, Jesus is revealed in the Old Testament as well as the New. The Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let's go to verses 17 and 18 of Revelation chapter 1. The Bible says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Friends, in these last days, as we prepare to receive the Lord Jesus in the clouds of heaven, the Lord would have us kneel before him as an act of homage to him who rules in the heavens and in the heavenly sanctuary. And we should also lift up our hands unto him as well. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 8 says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands, without wrath and doubting. And Psalms 141 verse 2 says, let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Friends, go ahead. You who are, who are to be part of the 144,000, lift up your hands to our Lord Jesus Christ in prayer. Second Chronicles 6.13 says, For Solomon had made a brazen scaffold of five cubits long and five cubits broad, and three cubits high, and had set it in the midst of the court, 
and upon it he stood and kneeled down upon his knees before all the congregation of Israel and spreading forth his hands toward the heavens yes that's what we should do in these last days when spread our hands to our great high priest in the heavenly sanctuary let's go to verse 19 of Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20 as we complete this section the Bible says in Revelation 1 19 write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches friends in this section we have seen the surprising key which unlocks for us the entire book of Revelation a knowledge of God's sanctuary in heaven and the location of our Lord in his ministry will truly keep us from misunderstanding the prophecies of this most precious book surely as we have seen our Lord Jesus is verily God but most importantly he's our great high priest He's the one who sat on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary, and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, and not man. That's Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1. And as we go to him, the Lord forgives us and cleanses us from all sins. He's the only mediator that we need. Christ is all-sufficient. And this knowledge of Christ and the heavenly sanctuary, friends, reveals, reveals for us the secret for understanding the book of Revelation. May we profit from this knowledge as we continue our study of the book of Revelation.